So let's kick off. Um, I said, I'm Kieran. Um, we're going to um, run through the agenda. I'm not going to introduce everybody. They'll introduce themselves quickly. I've got a, a quick 10 minutes at the beginning for um, normal round round performance of the year. Um, Ollie's the only person that isn't here physically, so we'll come up and do that. Ollie's allowed, he's on maternity leave. Um, so we've let him have the opportunity to come in virtually. Um, this, this is a sector that's always been subject to quite significant change, normally something from left field. Left field. Um, we always say that we can't actually forecast this industry because something will happen that we just weren't expecting. Normally, uh, regulatory change, sometimes tax. Um, very much this year, COVID pandemic, um, the ups and downs of that for the industry, and certainly uh, in, in the last 12 months also now, the impact of the war in Ukraine, um, the economic up and downs that that's brought on, movements in interest rates, there's been a lot of fluctuation in, in the sector overall, and we're continuing to see that. Um, I think it's also fair to say that the impact of regulation is becoming greater and greater particularly in the UK, the model that the UK regulators adopted, um, and we are absolutely seeing that that's now being replicated in other jurisdictions. So all these things do happen at quite a cost. We will take a five minute break um, at round 11. Um, I know that we've got this time, so that won't be quite right, but we'll take a five minute break, comfort break, um, for uh, anyone that's hearing online. Okay, let me just talk you through some performance matters. I shall go back and get too excited. Um, we do uh, we capture performance for the online industry. I just stress this is for online um, as part of the EGR Power 50. So uh, people do give us some um, information. Private companies give us information. We gather the public information as well. And we try to establish what is an online measure and see how things move year on year. We call it um, bagpipe, which is something I did Actually, in game performance index power 50 EGR, very, very clever. I thought I did that. Um, and uh, we, we run it year, year from year. And so we've actually now got quite a few years um, comparatives going back. So many that I actually dropped quite a few off at the beginning. Um, but this one is, is what we show each year just to show what's happened in the world of betting and gaming. We make up the market cap a little bit. So for private companies, we use the multiple. Um, we use Benchmark that against some of the private company price indexes. We see they have gone down. This is the first year we've seen a fall in, in the actual performance index that we use as a multiple. Additionally, we've seen some crazy things happen in the stock market. So market cap, unbelievably, when you compare it to June to June, is down by 50% or thereabouts. And um, so very, very significant fall. You know, that might give opportunities. You think prices have come down. Maybe more transactions will happen. Ollie's going to talk about that. Um, when we get to this session, um, yes, I think things have got cheaper, but also this is this is indicative of some of the crazy multiples that we saw uh, in the US, um, and also the impact now of interest rates going up and um, perhaps more difficult to get money. Yeah, yeah. So it'd be interesting to see what does happen, um, but very, very marked in terms of performance for uh, market cap. What's driving that? Actually, if you look at the um, NGR across the, the sector, and I should say, actually, we, we do sort of keep the constituents to what we put into the, the numbers um, consistent for the, all of those periods. So there's a little bit of subjectivity, but it's not the, it's not the whole sector. It's where we can keep it comparable. Um, but I, I guess I, 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 this was quite surprising. Net gaming revenue in the last 12 months has grown more than it ever has. Um, which, yes, COVID, um, yes, we've seen a switch to online, yes, we've seen um, some people not being able to spend elsewhere, um, land based, moved to online, but actually that's quite a dramatic um, number. Uh, so I think it's 17% 17, 17 for that year, which is the biggest growth um, in net gaming revenue in the year to June. <laughs> <clears throat> however, however, um, this is sorry, it's a mess. It's a it's a busy graph. Um, the the black line shows the growth or lack of growth this year in EBITDA 
the red line shows the actual margin of EBITDA. Um, it is adjusted EBITDA, so it's what the CFOs are reporting as an adjusted profit measure, um, and it is for the online elements of their business. Um, if I showed you the margin line without, you know, on a scale of its own, that is a very, very significant drop in margin for this year. We were probably expecting it um, for the last few years, and actually it never happened. Um, but this is the first year we've seen it, so the actual margin has dropped um, something like 7 8% um, from mid-20s down to less than 15%. So a very, very dramatic um, impact. As I said, that is partly increasing regulation, partly the impact of tax biting, it's partly the resumption of marketing activity that didn't happen during maybe the first year of COVID, um, but there's quite a lot of things that are driving um, very interesting results. Um, you would have seen VET365, which is not an insignificant proportion of um, what goes in here. Um, you know, they've only been able to pay a salary of up to, what, 220 million this year. Um, but in, in all seriousness, actually, the, the, the model has changed quite quite significantly for them. The amount of profit they're generating is just less. Competition's higher, but absolutely costs are higher. Maybe it's just maturing industry more and more now. OK, it was a very quick run through, nearly got us back to time. I'm going to hand over to David, who's going to do some accounting matters. We're trying to keep on time. Thank you, Kieran. Um, so as the slide says, I'm David Perry. I'm partnering with the Latin Gaming team here at BDL. Um, the photo there is reasonably old. Um, not as old as Kieran's, but <laughs> never mind. Um, what I'm planning on doing, and I'll try and keep to time as much as possible, we've got 15 minutes here, but um, we've got about 40 or so slides. So as a result of that, this will appear to be something of a canter through. Don't worry, if you've got any questions, please let me know. We can answer them as we go. We can answer them at the end, and you'll also be given a copy of the slide deck should you wish. And, uh, there's also a webinar link that I've put here. So to go through financial reporting, the, the, I suppose the headline is that there, there hasn't been too much that's changed over the course of the year. There's been no kind of introduction of new standards, but we do have some clarifications on some. Um, these are the, uh, the amendments that the ISB have come up with for the, uh, for the period December filers for December 22 year ends would be important. There's not, there's not extensive amendments. Um, they're all fairly niche. The one I've chosen to pull out is around onerous contracts, whereas previously one would include um, only the, the actual contracted costs of the contract that may or may not have been onerous when you're calculating onerous leases, sorry, not leases, explicitly not leases, but onerous contracts. The change now is that um, there's been clarification and you would include any directly attributable costs. So that would be direct costs that you can prove are effectively cost of sale um, down to something as, uh, as specific as depreciation. So the impact of that for companies is that their financial reporting team is going to have to consider whether those uh, contracts that were on the cusp previously are actually now pushed into an onerous position with all the disclosure requirements that, that come with that. Um, there's a couple of other points, that, or a couple of other slides that go through the various amendments that are in the post. So these will be for um, periods 2023 and 2024. Um, you can see these there. The, the implications of this um, is just, I, I suppose you need to keep an eye on them. Um, you need to disclose in your kind of accounting policy notes those um, that have been issued by the ISB but are not yet in effect. And if they're going to have a material impact to your companies, then what you'll need to do is, is disclose that it would be material. And if possible, the yeah, FRC are really keen on getting some kind of some kind of quantification on that. Right. So um, 2023, 24 onwards, but certainly worth having uh, a bit of a project to look at. That might uh, be for you. Um, 
as well as the ISB, there, there's a, a body called the IFRIC, and the IFRIC come up with uh, responses and conclusions to specific circumstances questions. So these interpretations will not be relevant for every single company, but what it will do is give you a guide uh, on how to apply um, your accounting policies. Again, there's quite a lot of niche stuff in here, so I'm not going to go into it in, in great detail, um, but if any of these trigger something for you, for example, Anything to do with SPAC transactions, then it's something worth um, getting the committee's uh, conclusions on and seeing how it marries up to your accounting policies. Um, one that I'll draw out, and actually I drew out last year, is around uh, electronic transfer settling receivables, and that's effectively fax payments, whether you recognise it as cash or you recognise it as an other receivable. Um, now, we talked about this last year, and the, and the conclusions haven't really altered since then but what has happened is that there hasn't been a finalization of this draft and the ISB are instead going to conclude on whether they will explore um, setting setting some standards or an amendment to standards in this instance. Um, impact on that for betting gaming companies in particular will be around uh, how you consider your digital wallets um, cash amounts to be classified. Um, in my view, that would then lead it to be classified as cash because it's readily available. Uh, I've seen it um, classified as receivable in the past. And also payment service providers and the balances helped with those. Um, I would, again, I probably put the, the, the reverse opinion on that and say that um, given the cash hasn't actually entered your bank account, you should have it as an other receivable uh, rather than cash or indeed trade receivables, although there is some leeway. So they just kind of, so it could be quite significant. So we're talking about we saw a lot of retailers actually restate for this already, um, slightly early. So Marks and Spencer's, I think, millions and millions they took out of cash, put into debtors. Absolutely the same with betting gaming. If it does get enacted, you'll find that your cash number will go down. Things in the chain until you've got control of it. I think once it hits a payment digital wallet. Probably got control of it, but until that point, you wouldn't actually recognise it as cash. It would definitely go to to uh, a debtor. Yeah, I think the rule of thumb is if you can use that cash to buy yourself a coffee or settle another obligation, then it is effectively cash. And so, if you have that as rule of thumb, that's obviously a bit nuanced with certain things there, but um, it will um, <coughs> um, sit well with the inbound uh, amendments if they if they do uh, conclude on it. The, the other area in terms of financial reporting that I want to raise is around um, the increasing inflation and what the impact is for groups on that. And I've listed out 10 areas where there could actually be some impact on the, the numbers. So you've got actuarial assumptions, anything to do, anything that has any kind of link to a, a discount rate or anything, anything like that. You, you need to think about whether inflation is going to have a material impact on that and perhaps work out how you might be able to get some advice or some support in determining what those amounts would be. Um, but again, I'm, I'm not going to focus on these in great detail, I'll just move through them. But if anything in there rings a bell, uh, then you should uh, establish whether you need to get some support. And Concluding on the discount rate point, I would um, make I would encourage you to look at the FRC's thematic review on discount rates itself, and it's also mentioned through in a quite useful annual review, report review of corporate reporting. Um, and those links will take through to that um, those two guides. Due course. And another area where I think the FRC will signal what they want to see uh, in financial reporting is around. Uh, various reports and they they try and influence corporate reporting through a number of mechanisms, one of which is the, the audit of the auditors and reviews of our files to make sure that we're pushing uh, audit entities to, to disclose the, the appropriate uh, things in their accounts, but also their annual review of corporate reporting. And you know, we've already mentioned the discount rate thematic review. Um, they've seen some uh, issues around uh, cash flow statement um, preparation and presentation, uh, judgments and estimates, and uh, also climate change reporting as well. Uh, and as such, those can be areas that are given particular focus by um, the FRC when they come to review 
company's accounts over the next year or so. Um, again, these are areas FRC will look at in particular and their expectations of what, what good looks like. And one of the themes in here is that, um, which isn't explicitly drawn out, is that they're looking for consistency through financial reporting, whether that's in the narrative or and or the back half. Um, any disclosures to, should, where possible, provide linkage, uh, clear expectations on numbers and, and so forth. But, uh, consistency is going to be an area that they're really going to focus on uh, over the next few years. So then to move on to climate change reporting, where we have seen some um, some criticisms from uh, the FRC and actually the FCA who, who engaged their own um, review of uh, disclosures. Um, specifically, uh, and this starts on the, uh, I think it's period beginning on or after the 6th of April 2022, is uh, new climate related financial disclosures um, for public quoted companies and large private companies as well. And it's based on um, TCFD, which we'll remind ourselves of in a second. Um, but effectively, any uh, PIEs or public interest entities over um, 500 employees would, uh, and AIM companies over 500 employees, or those with large turnover and open companies, would have to prepare uh, non financial information and sustainability disclosures. The only caveat being if you're in the AIM category, you don't include the um, uh, sustainability disclosure, it's just non financial information. It's a quick reminder of the um, four pillars of TCFD and the 11 recommended disclosures, um, which I won't go into in great detail, but suffice to say, the, the issues that the FRC and the FCA have found in some of the reporting um, is closely linked to the 11 um, key disclosures that was on the previous slide um, and there's uh, five areas that they are going to what they found particular issue with and therefore when their focus uh, review over the next year or so of the reporting of companies uh, will uh, will tackle these areas in particular so it, it's a good checklist to make sure that you wouldn't be in the firing line for any um, any uh, criticisms of disclosures just just to add to context you might in some ways what's this got to do with betting gaming and you're quite right um, all of these climate change and uh, tcfd disclosures are not as relevant as they might be for other industries however you've still got to do them um, and they're very difficult to get the information so next year when pretty much everyone has to start producing some of the information um you'll, you will need to spend some money and some time and if you don't do it this year it's much more difficult to do it uh, when you when you're looking backwards so yeah, so the restatement of comparatives, for example, is it, it's the previous year. So if you need to do it next year, then you're going to have to do the calculations for this year. As Kieran said, getting support on this is, is, is a good idea and doing it early on because it's, it's quite hard to do alongside um, your day job. Um, the other complexity uh, which comes out also in this um, in these slides on Bayes consultation is that there are increasingly huge numbers of dis, uh, definitions on what constitutes a public interest entity or entities that fall into scope for certain of these disclosures but others not so much so um, it's if you're around kind of a, a, a 500 employee um, a threshold um, or 500 um, revenue or there are certain distinctions uh, so definitions of market capitalization you, you need to just be mindful that you're you're not falling into the trap of missing out on um, what you need to be disclosing. Um, and as I said, the base consultation um, this was uh, put into place following some high-profile corporate failures. Um, Bayes published its consultation um, following various reviews into the uh, the audit market and corporate governance framework. Um, the consultation um, on the changes to UK governance code and audit reform. That's going to fall into Q2 2023. Um, and whilst we are we're not absolutely certain what, what is going to come in, um, we, we do expect there to be some change and some of it's going to be very uncomfortable um, to make sure that you're uh, ahead of the <coughs> various 
points here um, that would need to be considered. So uh, we've got a little bit more onus on directors to um, report on a going concern, which is in their resilience statement, which is a little bit more forward looking mm -hmm. um, statement on what they're doing to tackle fraud um, and also uh, disclosures around um, the ability to pay distributions and dividends. Um, in addition, we're going to have something that's a little bit more like um, a Sarbox environment um, where management provide an attestation that they sign up to. Well, this is, this is how SOX works, but it, we're not actually sure how it's going to be formed um, in the UK example, but some form of management attestation on the effect of, effectiveness of internal controls, which is not just a box tick exercise. It has to be something that you can uh, demonstrate that you've, you've found evidence for. Um, and it's also going to get very uncomfortable um, for us as well, because um, our Lovely regulator, the FRC, uh, may or may not be replaced by ARGA, um, which uh, is a, a body that ostensibly uh, looks like it's going to pay particularly more attention to um, the effectiveness of audit and also the effectiveness of directors as well. So it's a little bit more, uh, a little bit more uh, teeth to the regulatory. And then just a, a final point on PIE and various, um, this is yet another definition of PIE. Um, but again, we, we're not absolutely certain that this 750 employees turn over 750 is, is the final word in that, but again, something to keep an eye on. Um, and then I think I've covered these other areas and so I'll pause now um, to answer any questions you might have. Um, everyone, I think, will have access to this as a following the seminar. And the link, um, if clicked, will take you to YouTube, where our financial reporting update from December 22, which covers a lot of this, but in um, more detail than an hour-long webinar can provide, um, will present. Okay. Now, are we going to hand over to Ollie? Yes. Seamlessly. Nice. There he is. Hello, hello. Hopefully you can all uh, hear me in the room. Yeah, just finally. Uh, thank, thanks, Dave. Um, so, good morning, everyone. And sorry, sorry, I can't be with you in person today. Um, uh, the good news is, after having my newborn on Boxing Day, I did manage a couple of hours sleep last night. So um, I'll take that as a positive. Um, hopefully, won't crash immediately after this presentation. Um, so if you could just move on to the next slide, please. Whoever's got control. <laughs> one thing we didn't think of, <laughs> And the next one, please, Dave. Um, yeah, so thanks. So I'm going to spend the next sort of 10 minutes or so um, running through sort of the M&A activity we've seen in the market from the perspective of our transaction services team um, in London. So for those of you who um, I haven't met and we haven't worked with as a team, we focus on sort of financial due diligence, both on the buy and sell side um, during M&A uh, transactions. Um, and if you could flip to the next slide, please. Um, so initially, I just want to focus on in on Europe and, and what we've seen during the year um, with regards to M&A, some of the trends and, and, and highlight some of the deals. So um, as touched on by Kieran earlier, um, there has been a reduction in, in public activity, understandably, uh, due to sort of the macroeconomic pressures that we've all seen. Um, and you know share prices of those public companies being impacted what what that's paved the way for is um a larger amount of public to private deals um they're being seen as quite a uh, a good opportunity for public businesses to grow i guess one of the most prime examples of that would have been flutter's acquisition of sisal uh, for just under 2 billion euros back in august um um, and but despite what we're seeing in the in in terms of the, the macroeconomic pressures, we are still seeing a lot of opportunities um, 
for acquisitions, in particular for cash rich buyers, so businesses with a lot of cash um, who are seeking price opportunity at the moment, because maybe, um, you know, what some of the multiples we've seen in, in previous years are, are being slightly brought down, which provides an opportunity um, for those buyers. And um, as always, there are businesses always looking for bolt-ons to, to grow their businesses, um, which we're continuing to see at the moment in the market. Um, a continuing theme over the last few years has been sort of the breakup of those big operators. Um, whilst that's slow to an extent, there are still examples of that. Um, the most prime one that um, happened this year, which completed after it sort of been going for a while, was um, AAA's um, completion of the Will, Will Hill non-US at, uh, US assets. Um, so that was a large deal that completed during the year. Um, and another area which continues to um, always drive um, M&A is jurisdiction. So, um, the main markets that we've certainly been involved with this year um, have been sort of the Netherlands and Italy um, due to the new uh, regulations that have been introduced in those those jurisdictions. Um, one deal we were involved in, with was Entain's acquisition of Bet City. Um, so that was an example of Entain um, acquiring an incumbent operator to gain market share quickly. Um, which is um, we've seen that kind of deal around Europe for a while now. Um, but so we expect Netherlands to continue to attract interest. And Italy has had similar traction during the year. Um, another area of interest um, is private equity. So um, over the years, sort of private equity interest in, in betting and gaming businesses has evolved as the markets have regulated. Um, and what we're seeing is there there continues to be private equity interest in 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 businesses, in particular, in the B two B sector because they're that one step removed from direct direct regulation. Um, we were recently involved in a transaction um, for Vixio, which was formerly known as Gambling Compliance. Some of you might get the Gambling Compliance um, updates on a regular basis. Um, they were acquired by. Perwin, um, a private equity house, um, which is an example of a, a deal in that space. Um, the UK government's white paper, it's um, I know a lot, a lot of us have been waiting for that announcement for a while, um, but we do expect that to actually bring some some M&A type of, of type opportunities because the expectation of, of that is it's going to be focused on customer data and affordability checks. Um, what that might uh, rise um, action to is, is the acquisition of businesses that focus on automation um, and help operators with those, those affordability checks. So that is something that we'll be looking out for in 2023. Um, and then the final couple of points to focus in on Europe is uh, the B2B content creator market continues to expand. Um, those content creators are getting bigger and bigger, but we're also seeing that operators want to bring that content creation in-house, partly to, you know, to have control over the games they're releasing and but also to eliminate the, the necessity to pay revenue shares where possible. Um, so um, there, there continue to be a lot of deals involving um, B2C acquiring B2B businesses um, and B2B to B2B. Um, one example in the year was Evolution's acquisition of the slot developer No Limit City, um, and we expect to see more deals of that nature in the next year. Um, and then finally, uh, there are these new product verticals which continue to draw in test and in, in terms of M&A. So artificial intelligence, virtual and augmented reality and esports betting. Um, it, it is still very much in, in some aspects uh, an evolving, evolving product vertical across all of those. But we are now seeing M&A deals in that space. And I think one example was sports radars acquisition of AI solution specialist Vikes during the year. Uh, if you could just flick to the next slide, please. Thank you. 
Uh, then moving slightly further afield to the US, which, as we all know, has been such a um, sort of hotbed for M&A activity in, in, rec in the recent years as, as the states um, open up one by one. Um, there has been a slight slowdown in the large scale consolidation that we had seen this year. Um, whilst it has continued, I think that's partly because of those macroeconomic pressures that we were discussing earlier. Understandably, it's, it's impacting the US as well. Um, but interestingly, from a European perspective, there are still um, a lot of bolt on opportunities involving European businesses which have that established presence and expertise are seen as, um, you know, great effectively M&A targets by North American businesses. Um, an interesting one that we were involved in recently was um, Playmaker Capital, a Toronto Stock Exchange affiliate business. Uh, they acquired an affiliate platform called Wedge Traffic um, based in Scotland. And that was an example of them wanting to, to gain the expertise and, and knowledge of, of that sort of European business um, and bolt it on to their existing North American business. Um, in terms of the sports betting market in the US, it, content, it continues to be very competitive outside of the big, the big three, the so-called big three, FanDuel, DraftKings and MGM, which still have such a large market share. So typically what we're seeing is from outside of that big three that there's a lot of cash burn and non-profitability amongst other businesses which are effectively scrambling to get that market share within within individual states and i think the the outlook the view is that what will really give these businesses a, a path to prof profitability going forwards will be the regulation of i casino in the us um obviously the time scale of that and when it's going to happen and in which states is still very much unknown but as we've seen in europe the once businesses are able to diversify from just sports into i casino it's a it's a great way to move um, customers cross cross refer customers on websites and ultimately allow more profitability. So we do expect to see that in the US. It's just it's a bit of a way coming uh, coming just as as yet. Uh, we touched upon when I spoke last year SPAC, so special purpose acquisition companies being quite a um, well it it was a, a very popular way for deals um, in the US, in particular in 21 and 20, 2020. Um, it's become slightly less popular in recent times. And I, I think the reality of that is um, whilst it was seen as a more attractive pricing um, opportunity as opposed to, say, the traditional IPO route, some of those that pricing um, has has started to fall away and, and it's it's not been as lucrative as it, it was once seen. And there's also been some added complexities into the SPAC process and the documentation involved from going through a SPAC process, which perhaps has meant that we've seen slightly less activity than than we had in recent years in, in terms of SPACs. Um, and then to finally just touch on some other jurisdictions, um, Ontario in Canada um, ha went live during the year and, and um, it's expected to be one of the, the largest gambling markets in North America. So we were involved in um, um, Entertain's acquisition of uh, Avid Gaming Group, which trades as Sports Interaction, which is an example of a deal in, in that space. And we expect that to be a continued area of interest into next year. Um, and LATAM, I'll, I'll just touch on that briefly. Um, as the licensing procedures and regulations develop in LATAM, we do expect, you know, Argentina, Brazil, Mexico, Peru to attract interest next in, in the coming years. But but it is a market that is um, being treated with, with a little bit of caution just whilst those that licensing procedures develop. Um, thank you. If you could just move to the final slide. Uh, and I'll just leave you with some thoughts for 2023, um, some of the trends we expect to see. Uh, so I, I touched on the UK Gambling app uh, white paper earlier. So the impact on, on, on UK operators, but also how that might impact m and is, is something that will be looked at once that, that white paper announcement does occur. Uh, live games continue to be 
very popular amongst players. So uh, the expectation is that live games will sort of continue to overtake random number generator games just because of that movement that was seen during COVID of people wanting that real experience. Um, uh, and, and we expect that to continue um, this year. We know that mobile has been such an attractive um, growth area for, for, for all businesses in recent years, and that's now evolving into sort of wearable technology and smartwatch based gaming apps. And, and that's an interesting area to watch out for. I touched I touched earlier on virtuals and augmented reality and um, esports, um, and I'm sure if for a lot of us who will be at ICE in, in February, it'll be interesting to see some of the examples of of those fast growing pr products that they normally um, put out and demonstrate. So we'll be looking out for that, but definitely an area to watch out for in terms of M&A. And then finally, just to touch on sort of crypto casino, um, whilst it hasn't been an area that we've been involved in in a transaction, it, it is increasingly popular as 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 players seek new ways to gamble um uh whilst obviously the wider crypto market will impact this but we do see um sort of those crypto casinos becoming um more a, a larger area of interest going forwards it's only sort of going one way so it'll be interesting to see how that translates into um the m a landscape so i think um i'll leave it there just conscious of time um but if you um you know in the next year if you are thinking about um a sale in the near future or or an ipo once the market sort of warms up again or indeed want advice around sort of due diligence more generally please please reach out to um uh, the ts B G team um in london we, we're always happy to speak to you thank you um and i'll hand over i think it's to fiona um and clarinda on economic crime Uh, great. So uh, I'm not Fiona and Clorinda. Um, I'm just Clorinda. Uh, Fiona is joining virtually. We are um, operating a new true hybrid model in our economic crime team. So uh, just to kick off really briefly, I will um, hand over to Fiona to introduce herself and then I will introduce myself fully as well. Hi everyone, hopefully you can all hear me. Um, so yeah, my, my name is Fiona Raystrick. I'm a partner here at BDO, have been for a good number of years now, um, and I head up our economic crime advisory team, uh, which covers all aspects of economic crime uh, and also all aspects, uh, all, all sectors, uh, both, uh, well, basically all regulated sectors in relation to economic crime, including betting and gaming, financial services, real estate, etc. cetera. Um, so hand over to Clorinda. Um, I'm Clorinda, I'm a senior manager within the Economic Crime Advisory Team, which Fiona mentioned. Um, my primary focus within the team is on the betting and gaming sector. Um, so I work quite a lot proactively and reactively with firms, um, a lot to do with the regulatory agenda, compliance, AML and social responsibility. So that's going to be the main focus of our agenda for our <coughs> 10 to 15 minutes today. Um, in terms of specifics, what we'd like to, to spend a bit of time talking to you guys about. Um, firstly, we're going to touch on anti-money laundering, specifically looking at risk assessment and the risk-based approach. Um, in particular, some of the themes that we're seeing come out coming out of enforcement um, and also after the work that we've been doing within um, operators in the sector. Secondly, touching upon social responsibility or responsible gambling, however you'd like to name it, um, and talking about, I guess, the, the key hot topic at the moment, which is remote customer interaction guidance. Um, and then our, our final slide will cover um, documentation of risk, manage, risk management, which kind of applies across the board in terms of AML and SR, so we thought that would be a good closing topic. So I will take a step back from the lectern for the first slide and hand over to Fiona to talk about our AML piece. Great, thank you. Um, so yeah, just a really brief slide and then I'll hand back to Clorinda. I just wanted to really cover some of those lessons learned from the enforcement cases that we've seen uh, as they are coming in relatively thick and fast. So we're always keen to collate uh, any lessons learned, anything new that the that the, um, the regulator is, is driving uh, and the, those messages. Um, we're going to cover just a couple of areas, the risk assessment and risk-based approach, which hopefully are terms you're all familiar with. Um, just in terms of the risk assessment, so it's, it's actually a really key topic in the sector something that we know that the UKGC is, is really focusing on. 
And it's relevant to both those who are both in and out of scope of the money laundering regulations. If you're in scope, it's regulation 18. If you're out, actually, the requirements from the UKGC in paragraph 12 still require a risk assessment to be conducted. And it's, it's just really important because it's basically demonstrating to all and management, et cetera, that you really un fundamentally understand the risks associated with the business that you're operating in relation to AML. So some of those findings, some of those feedback we're identifying, uh, as you can see from the slide, the first one, not specifically tailored enough to the business. It's really easy to be tempted to just get an off-the-shelf uh, technology solution to de demonstrate and document your risk assessment templates that you might get from third parties that are possibly more akin to the banking sector and not sufficiently tailored. Um, you, you really do need to make sure you invest the right amount of time to use that as a guide, but then actually develop this really unique and specific to yourselves, your business model, your risk profile, and making sure that you're using the information you have available, data, uh, evidence, uh, information, you know, your customer base, uh, your issues that have already arisen and crystallized, and therefore using that to inform your risk assessment. So, yeah, it's, it's really important. We've seen it quite often that those risk assessments aren't typically sufficiently tailored. The second point is, is, is linked, uh, not, uh, not complete or missing or new emerging risks. Um, the risk assessment is, is a live document. It should be re reviewed at least annually, but it should be uh, demonstrating that you're on top of your new and emerging risks. And also that uh, if, if risks change, that you're reflecting that within the risk assessment as well. Uh, so it's, it's really important to make sure that you've, uh, one, when you're actually putting it together, really kicked all the tyres, looked at all aspects of business, really considered where those risks may arise, but also thinking about emerging risks. So what data and information flows do you have internally uh, that may be demonstrating new risks are arising within your business? What are you seeing from external sector-wide data and information about player demographics or you know, ONS income data in relation to cost of living crisis that might be shifting the risks that are associated with your business? If you're looking at the specific your own specific business, you know, has uh, crypto become more of a, a an aspect within your business than it was previously? And now does that really need to be brought to the front within that risk assessment? So it's, it's really important that it's kept up to date and that it's um, it leads into the next point. It's really used within the business for that decision making. Um, Often risk assessments get produced, they do get reviewed on an annual basis and then they get left and they don't really get used in anything else. Actually, that risk assessment should feed into your management information, the data feeds that you're getting, your governance structure, the board, uh, relevant committees of how you're actually discussing, well, what are those risks arising? Oh, is our control framework still sufficiently robust to mitigate those risks? Do we need to approach some form of de-risking strategy about a particular type of uh, activity that's going on? So that the main message around risk assessment is do it, do it well, uh, keep it up to date uh, and, and really use it as part of your business rather than just seeing it as a quite annoying uh, regulatory requirement. Just then quickly on the risk based approach piece, um, I was keen to share here again some of the things we can kind of see. Um, risk based approach, you, know, you do need to apply a risk based approach. That can vary in how complex it might be, depending, obviously, on the underlying business. Um, if you are a relatively simple small operator with only one or two products, it's going to be a it's going to be a lot less sophisticated. Your approach to EDD is going to be less sophisticated than someone who's got multiple brands and a you know, multifaceted customer base. So, do make sure it's, it's tailored and that you've evidenced how you've got how you've reached that conclusion, how you've reached that approach, why you think that that levels and layers of due diligence approach makes sense in line with the customer base that you've got. It is important to remember that one size does not fit all. And when UKGC comes in, when your internal auditors come to visit, if you're asked to do an independent audit by a third party, they will want to see that you've evidenced and demonstrated why is that risk-based approach actually relevant? Have I understood it? Am I just applying an arbitrary method or a standard method across all customers? And, and again, that might not actually fit the risks associated. Um, 
they expect that obviously the documentation around the um, risk-based approach is really solid. You've got good examples in there as to well, how do you apply this risk-based approach? So you're demonstrating that the people that are then going to use those controls and processes actually understand what it is you're doing, um, rather than it just being inconsistent and, and, and not sufficiently uh, controlled uh, across the board. So again, have that really well documented and also have it really well monitored around uh, your compliance monitoring, your, as I say, internal audit, second line assurance activities that really make sure that you're applying that risk-based approach mm -hmm. in a very solid way. Um, the, the last point was just around uh, collaboration. Um, it is making sure that you know, you, you don't you don't have to look at this alone. You can obviously consider um, use of other forms of data and information to be able to leverage those to then help you inform that risk based approach. They can be, that can be your own data, but also can be data you can obtain from from the, the sectors. So do, again, make sure that you're really kicking the tires on this approach regularly um, and that you, you really demonstrate that it's it's fit for purpose for you as a firm rather than just a standard uh, a standard model that could apply to anybody right i'll hand back to clorinda thanks Fiona. um so switching topic um sort of completely and talking about social responsibility we're we're very conscious it's been a, a pretty turbulent time for those operating in the digital space um especially with the remote customer interactions and the, and the changes that have been through this um, don't worry, I'm not going to talk through uh, every single piece on that slide, but I, I, I sort of it helped me to, to sort of really think about the timeline of events that have happened. So a key thing that I wanted to bring out, we've obviously now had two consultations, um, one a couple of years ago and one currently ongoing relating to this topic. I'm conscious that that's sort of caused a little bit of tension within the market. Um, there's been a lot of frustration around why are the GC asking the same thing over and over again? Why can't we gain an agreement and consensus on this topic? Um, we would urge any anyone in this room, it may not be applicable to you, but potentially your MLRO or Head of Financial Crime Compliance do respond to the consultation to provide your thoughts. It closes, uh, I believe, a week on Monday, so a couple of days left to provide a response. Something really key to bring in at the moment as well relates to um, a little bit on that red hand side, which is uh, dates that have already passed, whereas the grey side is, is dates that are coming in the future. So on that red side, um, Social Responsibility Code Provision 3.4.3, which relates to the customer interaction guidance, uh, the actual Social Responsibility Code is in force currently. Um, the guidance is not, the guidance has been decommissioned, but the actual code piece is in force. There's a couple of chapters of that, uh, or paragraphs of that, which aren't, uh, which is paragraphs one and two, um, and also 10. Uh, 10 is coming into force in a couple of weeks time on the 12th of February. So it's really important to be kind of gearing up to that um, and getting ready for that. The commission have been quite clear in their stance that regardless of the consultation and whatever comes out of that, um, the provisions around number 10, which is all to do with providing marketing, um, are going to be in force come the 12th of February. So it's really important that controls are left to scratch with respect to that, but also staff have been trained, governance structures have been amended, et cetera, um, to remain compliant with that, that paragraph 10 that comes into, into force soon. And then the final point I wanted to touch upon it is kind of that last piece on the slide in terms of TBC 2023, um, and also the piece at the bottom around identify, act and evaluate. The challenge we face in this sector is that we don't have a crystal ball, we don't know what's coming down the line. The consultation closes a week on Monday, but we don't know what the, the Commission's stance is going to be in terms of further guidance, in terms of changing the, the, the sort of approach that's, that's currently in place. However, if we sort of look back to some of the recent enforcement action, we definitely see that this is an area that's close to the Commission's heart. So we've seen lots of wording in settlements that talks to failure to identify customers at risk of harm, um, talks to failing to evaluate um, evaluate how, uh, how that's taken place and what, what steps should be taken next and also failing to document the steps taken um, to, to interact with that customer and try and taper that activity. So, albeit that the, the landscape is turbulent and we don't have a crystal ball, we don't know what's coming down the track, it's definitely a topic that 
uh, isn't going to go away. Um, and we're almost going to have to sort of react and roll with the punches slightly. But absolutely, this, this particular topic area is something that we see we're having conversations about it all the time with operators and something that really should be pretty high up on agendas if it's not already. And then moving finally on to keep to time uh, in terms of our third topic, as I mentioned at the start, this is very much applicable across both anti-money laundering and social responsibility. And, and Fiona also mentioned it in, in her slide previously about the importance of documenting what you do. Um, the Commission clearly evidences from its settlements that they have a sense of essentially if it's not written down, it didn't happen. Um, so an operator may be implementing all sorts of wonderful controls and doing all sorts of wonderful processes, but actually if that's not justified and rationalised and written down, it's really, really difficult to be able to um, articulate to the regulator how you gain comfort that you're applying a risk-based approach or preventing customer harm, et cetera, et cetera. I've put some sort of food, food for thought questions on the slide. I'm not planning to go through these in detail, but hopefully these will provoke some um, some sort of thoughts in your mind. Um, but what I wanted to do in particular was uh, actually talk to some things that we're seeing in the sector as to how operators are trying to, to do better at this, to hopefully try and um, share some knowledge and insights. Um, so the first one we see a lot is implementing sort of um, customer risk management tools, end-to-end -end solutions that really help to act as a repository and an audit trail. Um, of all activity undertaken. These are online platforms that enable every, um, every individual to the organisation to log on, have a profile, and it, it sort of creates that sort of um, blow by blow account of everything that's taken place, whether that's customer due diligence, whether that's customer interactions, whether that's risk assessment, um, all sorts of different activities, all logged in one place, um, time stamped, et cetera. So that seems to be going quite well in a lot of operators and obviously an approach that's smiled upon by, by the Commission in terms of record retention. Similarly linked to that, something that we're really um, interested in seeing more of is, is things like use of blockchain. Um, so blockchain in the, in the financial services world is, is kind of favoured in a way because it, it produces that immutable record um, that can't be changed or tampered with or transactions that take place in a banking context, but actually it can be used in lots of wider contexts, um, such as record keeping, because it has those, those wonderful properties um, that mean it creates a really robust audit trail. So um, nice to be able to talk about um, some positive uses of blockchain rather than some of the, the scarier consequences that we've been seeing in the media um, of the last couple of weeks and months. And then finally, from me, just talking to a couple of pain points, I know we've sort of spoken a lot about customer due diligence and social responsibility, um, but just wanted to highlight to attention a couple of other areas that we're seeing from our work where operators may be falling short when it comes to documentation of risk management. Um, the first one being in the context of suspicious activity reporting. Um, so we often see that um, a SAR log might be maintained, um, which is great to justify why, um, why a particular case was escalated externally to the regulator to, to try and prevent um, money laundering on a, a domestic scale and an international scale. But something that we often don't see is where cases were escalated to the money laundering reporting officer, but then the decision was taken to not file the SAR. Um, what investigation took place to determine that actually that activity was absolutely fine um, and not indicative or potentially indicative of criminal behaviour. So having a robust SAR log and um, documentation of why a SAR was filed or why not, really, really important. Fiona's already touched on it in terms of risk assessments. Um, often we are presented as consultants with a very funky Excel spreadsheet that's full of mathematics that says this is how my risk assessment's done, which is great. But what the Commission tends to expect is something um, more uh, word-based um, an approach and methodology that really sets out um, the purpose of the risk assessment, when it's done, how frequently, how it's intended to be done and how it's being intended to be used. Um, so it, as much as having that actual um, operational model in Excel is, is wonderful, underpinned by lots of um, fancy calculations and formulae, <laughs> actually having a standalone approach that you can provide to either auditors, regulator to say, look, this is, this is our business-wide risk assessment in a nutshell is also quite essential and expected. 
Um, and then finally, for me, the other part that we often see challenges in terms of documentation is actually articulating risk appetites. We, we see a lot of operators who will have a statement that says something along the lines of we have a zero tolerance for um, financial crime and we believe we have a low exposure. And that's all brilliant. That's that's great. But sitting behind that, we often don't see a lot of justification as to how the operator has determined that they have a low exposure. Um, what controls and metrics they're using to track that to make sure that they continue to operate in line with risk appetites, um, how they're using metrics, so key risk indicators, key performance indicators, et cetera, to, to validate that assertion and to remain within tolerance. So conscious we've <laughs> covered quite a few different topics um, in that session, hopefully that was that was useful. I must admit, I'm not actually sure who I'm handing over to next. <laughs> Um, but I will happily hand over the baton. Are we doing time wise? Do I have uh, take take my time? We've got, we've got time built in. So it's, it's still morning. So good morning, everyone. Um, Jason Garchok, I'm one of the partners with Home Digital, focusing on cybersecurity. Lots of familiar faces this morning. Some of them. When you see through a screen that big, so it's a, still a bit awkward when you see somebody for the first time in real life. Um, no funny jokes this morning, so you just yeah, with me being funny looking. Um, so today I'm going to be talking to you a bit about third party risk, which is um, something that's quite prevalent in, in, in terms of cyber breaches that we see. And you know, if I stand back and I reflect on the concept of operational resilience, and you know, that's a, a, a slogan that's been thrown around in a, in a number of sectors, most predominantly in financial services, but we are seeing it being adopted across other sectors. Um, and if we look at the, the, the kind of, you know, this is my own take on operational resilience, but it's six of one, half dozen the other, everyone kind of talks a, a bit about the same concepts. The one that kind of pops up all the time is, is third party risk. And if you think about yourselves in terms of your organizations, and even in your your personal circumstances at home, you have a number of third parties that you would engage with and are reliant on. So if you stand back and you think a bit about where the, the market is going from a third party compliance perspective and, and just looking at the end in sight, um, what we're seeing is, is, is movement of awareness from very low around third party risk to almost that equilibrium of maturity. So we're, we're seeing organizations are no longer in a, in a state where they've got no idea around third party risks and the stats around the survey that I'm gonna show you this morning talk to that. But the solution around how organizations deal with third party risk is not quite at a mature level yet. So we're seeing within the market, um, clients handling this, this challenge in a number of different ways. Um, and it, it, it would be unfair of me to, to pretend that I don't have a solution at the end, um, which is a, a, a BDO derived third party risk management solution. And I'll talk a bit about, a bit about that. Uh, it's a good solution, um, besides the fact that it comes from BDO, but also because clients are grappling with this challenge, skill shortage, skill shortage and the cost of compliance as a whole um, is, is, is driving the, the costs of employment and ultimately managing this risk in, in the wrong direction. <coughs> so the Cyber Risk Alliance produced a survey um, in terms of the, the market segments, it's quite interesting. So that, you know, they covered from small to enterprise and in terms of the respondents, um, you know, medium and large makes up just over 50%, which, you know, which is a, it's a good survey. And, and you'll forgive me, when you look at the percentages um, of the slides that don't add up to 100%, which is quite, Weird. And so why would a firm that's based, you know, predominantly on audit have numbers that don't add up to 100? And that's because having gone through the the, the survey and that, the results a number of times, um, respondents across the different sectors could answer multiple times because obviously the way that you manage the body risk is not necessarily consistent um, within organisations. So, um, but what's clear is what <clears throat> what's coming out in terms of the messaging. So this is around supply chain visibility. Um, and and when, when I looked at previous surveys that, that I had access to, um, what I saw in previous years was the don't know or can't see supply chain um, risk 
was much higher. And in this survey, it only really accounts for 10% for of, of the respondents going, I don't know, or I've got limited visibility. Um, and 41% said, I, I can see um, our, our dependency on, on critical third parties. So the data is moving in the right direction. It, it really, really is. Um, what I'm not seeing is I'm not seeing a, a significant reduction in issues relating to third party risk. So breach, um, disclosure of information, um, malware infiltrating by third parties. I'm not seeing a change in that. So what the data is telling me is it's, it's kind of, yes, I know I've got a risk. Um, I've got better visibility on it, but I, I don't necessarily know that I'm choosing the right third parties while they're adequately able to manage them to the right outcome. So um, if you look at what the concern, what the data is saying around the concern of third parties, it, it's really no different. Um, everyone's worried about uh, malware, malware infiltrating through a third party, data leakage, business disruption. So the business disruption component, I think there's, there's definitely a greater awareness around business disruption from third parties, and that's that's on the increase. And then reputational damage is kind of inconsistent in the data that I'm, that I'm seeing. And the last one of, of the survey, we're going to consolidate the results, which is, you know, the challenge around managing risk for third parties or assessing risk for third parties. Uh, and and the, the top one that's, that most uh, of the survey organizations chose was the lack of qualified staff to implement third party management solutions, prioritizing, assessing, and managing the large number of partners, and the lack of resilience around third parties from a malware attack. So you know, stand back and going, we've got lots of third parties. We don't necessarily know how to manage them. We don't necessarily have. You know, the, 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 the staff and the skills to implement the right processes and so on and so forth. But I think it's more than that. I think it's, it also stems from the fact that if you look at the regulatory environment that is being put on all of us, um, it's driving the, the, the focus around risk management to other areas. So ultimately, while we know we've got third party risk, we don't necessarily get to it because there are far more pressing things that we really need to get to. Um, you know, and that's, I guess, so different to, to across different sectors. Um, ultimately, that's kind of where things are going. So, you know, consolidated view, you know, the thing, you know, how do organizations evaluate the risk, you know, internally third party assessments, that's, you know, the, the greatest majority of, of what people answered and said they were doing. But I think ultimately what you're finding, what we're seeing, especially when we, we go and we help clients implement a managed solution, is that they just weren't adequately assessing all third parties. They were going, well, these are the ones that we really need to be concerned about, which you might reflect on and go, that makes perfect sense. But ultimately, the way in which they were vetting them wasn't necessarily um, adequate. So they were, in their minds, assessing the most critical ones, but they weren't the most critical. They just weren't getting the right coverage. Um, partner references, so that's, you know, um, hey, we're thinking of, of going with so-and-so to provide the service. Were they good for you? Yes, okay, we'll go with that, um, which is, you know, in terms of assessments, it's probably not adequate from a third party perspective. Um, and what's interesting about this slide is, is more but about who is doing the assessment. So typically what we see um, within organizations is procurement is providing a, a overarching assessment uh, service for organizations. And ultimately, procurement don't necessarily have specialists around risk assessment and understanding the impact from from a business perspective, really zoning in on assessing the risk for that third party. Um, what is what has increased is um, ultimately risk compliance, betting, um, and assessing third parties. So if you kind of look across the the, the, the horizontal plane for betting and evaluating third parties, risk and compliance and procurement make up the majority of, of within an organisation who's assessing third parties. But what you actually want is you want less from procurement and more from a risk compliance perspective because those are the, those are the people within the organization that have the right mindset. Um, so, so we kind of need those things to be moving. Um, IT, you would expect to have a great percentage of the monitoring um, responsibility because ultimately from a digital enablement perspective and, and dependency on third parties, you know, a lot of these are going to be IT related or IT driven components, in which case IT should be monitoring them in a greater manner, but we're finding they're not. So um, I'm going to skip this one just in the, in the interest of time and just kind of get to the, the core um, service offering. So ultimately, what, what we're offering is it, it's not the silver bullet. 
um, and and it's a bit I akin it to a bit like dancing. You need a dancing partner to get the managed service to work effectively. So ultimately, if organizations don't necessarily have the right maturity in terms of commitment for us to implement the solution, it doesn't necessarily work. But where organizations are going, look, we know we have a problem. We don't necessarily have the, the, the right skills internally, and we also don't have them on scale to be able to implement them. Um, we're looking for third party to partner with. The solution works really well. Um, so ultimately, it's, it's made up of, of a number of components, but we've got a bespoke platform that will go out and not only assess third parties on your behalf, but it will actually do things like vulnerability scans, or scan the dark web for, for data leakage associated with, with this um, supplier. It will actually go into procurement databases and see what open source data is available. So it's providing that, that digital side of, of fast enablement um, using multiple platforms to provide a risk score around third parties independent of the actual vetting that's been done. Um, if they're providing a traditional SOC 2 YSE 3000 insurance report, the platform will absorb that. Those, those are, are standardized frameworks so we can actually pull out the right data. We can look for anomalies and we can automate a, a broad percentage of the manual work that most organizations are doing. So ultimately, if you look at um, what the platform's providing, it's, it's providing a risk framework for third parties and integrates with, with most of most. Um, Ticketing system. So if you if you're a um, if you've got uh, Monday or or, um, or um, Workday or any one of these these ultimate, um, ERP systems, it will actually integrate with that, pull out your third parties, look at spend, uh, analyze everything. Um, there is a manual process around working with you to actually understand, um, even though you're you're spending a few million with this particular supplier, what is it that they're doing? Because we can't necessarily get that data out of the system. So you know. Spending a million pounds on a catering and supply is not, probably not going to be where the risk is for, for you as an organization. So we kind of normalize that data and we actually implement the framework and automate what we can. So by and large, you know, we start off with an assessment phase, we validate, prioritize, um, we come up with a mitigation plan around high risk suppliers, medium risk suppliers, and kind of work our way down. Um, and then we provide a monitoring and a response service. So ultimately where the deficiencies within the third party will let you know, we'll recommend um, remediation activities for that third party to implement. Um, and actually, if you want to, you can extend it to us actually engaging with that third party and re-auditing them um, for any providing support to them. And then for non-critical suppliers, um, we'll just assess, uh, validate, and prioritize um, as they move within the organization. So typically, what do clients say that have, have, have purchased this from us? Um, it enables their, their, the people within the organization to focus on the areas that they're better at and where there's um, a different kind of risk profile for the organization. It frees up resourcing, enabling them to focus. Um, cost efficiencies is significant. So the platform itself provides a number of efficiencies. If you take the return on investment in terms of implementing a third-party risk management solution in order to vet, monitor, analyze, and the, the, the people power around that to drive that, there's significant efficiencies. So um, the key takeaway here is visibility is increasing around third parties. The ability to assess effectively within your own organizations is probably still questionable. Um, ultimately, lack of, of capacity is driving which third parties you're assessing to which level, um, and third parties themselves not necessarily um, still seeing the risk that they can they can that they can introduce into your environment. So that typically you can't rely on the fact that they're a brand name and they're doing the right things. You still need to assess. Um, BDO solutions it's not fit for everyone, um, but we've had some great success. Thank you for your time this morning. Over to the studio, hence Jason Lincoln. We are going to take a very quick <clears throat> comfort break. Welcome back, everyone. Yeah. Thanks for sticking with us. We're about to run through a number of tax topics and um, starting with the corporate tax update. Um, I'm Daisy Bolton Bauer, I'm a director in our corporate international tax team, um, and I'm going to share a brief run through of topics and key updates that we hope will be of relevance and interest to the sector. Um, starting off with one of our favourite topics, transfer pricing, um, we continue to see tax authorities um, prioritise transfer pricing and with a particular 
um, scrutiny in the sector. Um, uh, a particularly big update um, is with Malta. Malta, for the first time, is introducing transfer pricing regulations. We had the detailed guidance come through towards the end of last year. Um, key pieces being um, the rules will apply to cross-border transactions, but there is the comfort of an SME exemption to similar businesses. Um, and I think what this means for the sector is if you have Maltese entities, um, now is the time to start reviewing your transfer pricing arrangements. Can these comply with the new rules coming in in Malta? And perhaps there's also some opportunities to think about wider planning and your and whether your TP policy is appropriate or can be tweaked. Um, <coughs> moving on to the UK, the UK, unlike Malta, already has transfer pricing rules, but what's coming in is mandatory documentation requirements, and these will apply from April 23, um, and for UK companies that are part of large groups, large groups being those that have annual consolidated revenues above 750 million euros. In terms of what those documentation requirements are, there'll, there'll be a need to have a master file and a local file prepared in accordance with OECD guidelines. There's also a requirement to have a summary audit trail. And in terms of what that means, um, there was expected to be a HMRC consultation, but that's been pushed back. And um, so we're still waiting some details on that. But what I think this new piece really emphasises is that HMRC are more interested now in what businesses are doing in terms of documenting and implementing a transfer pricing policy and there'll be more attention and more scrutiny on what TP controls and processes are in place. Um, and I guess just to cover off TP, we've got some of our TP team in the room and on hand more widely to answer any questions or talk through any um, bits of interest. And um, moving on to a slightly different topic, ORIC. ORIC stands for um, Offshore Receipts in Respect of Intangible Property. It's a UK piece of legislation and it applies to non-UK resident companies um, that have UK derived amounts and it applies those UK derived amounts um, and brings them within the scope of UK income tax. Um, we know a lot of you have already looked at these rules when they came in in 2019 and I think quite a common position is that businesses in this sector do not have a liability um, to UK income tax under these rules. What is new and I guess what we've seen as a bit of a shift on this topic is that HMRC is now turning its attention to whether online operators may be within the scope of the rules. We are aware of a number of operators receiving um, notices from HMRC on this topic. Some are businesses that have registered for OREP and filed new returns, some are businesses that have not registered, so it's fairly um, wide. HMRC are keeping their public <laughs> quite close to their chest on this, so we don't at this point in time know quite where they might be going with their technical arguments, but what we do know is they're primarily looking at Gibraltar companies and in the tax year 1920, so before the protections of the UK GIB Treaty came in. Um, and I think what we can also take away from this is that HMRC may not be um, too readily accepting um, the view that um, the view that you know online operators are just easily outside of scope. So we're happy to talk through any concerns people have, and we'd also just suggest remaining alert to um, the potential risk of getting a HMRC inquiry notice on this topic. Um, moving on to the next. The next box we've got on this slide, cross-border working. COVID has obviously really changed the way lots of um, businesses allow employees to work. Um, one of the big changes we've seen is obviously people working remotely from different locations. And I guess if, just as an example, if you're a Gibraltar company and you've allowed people to work um, say from home in Spain or another territory that's not Gibraltar, there can be tax risks, particularly as those arrangements become more long term or permanent. There's risks of tax resident challenges, particularly if the individuals in question hold management roles. There can also be employment 
um, tax reporting considerations. So just as a, a broad point, we're always encouraging people to think about what's changed in terms of those working practices. And as things become more permanent, just thinking about whether processes or protocols need to be tweaked because there can be associated tax risks. Um, coming on to a, a more international piece with Brazil, um, as Oli touched upon in his update earlier, um, aside from the events at the weekend, we know Brazil um, is an area lots of businesses are interested in as um, legislation um, remains on the table. Um, in the same way Oli mentioned having taking a bit of caution around licensing requirements, we'd also suggest taking caution from a tax perspective. Brazil is a notably um, complex tax system. For one, it has a huge number of taxes to try to get to grips with. Um, and as a secondary point, Brazil has historically diverged a lot from what we see in terms of international tax principles. And that can present a lot of challenges for um, non-Brazil groups looking to move into Brazil. Um, some good news, I think for those of us who work in tax, I would almost go as far to say exciting news is there have been some recent developments that may make it a bit easier for particularly UK businesses looking to go into Brazil. One is Brazil's announced its intention to be more aligned with the OECD on topics such as transfer pricing. Um, and there's also, towards the end of last year, it was announced that um, the UK and Brazil are entering into a double tax treaty. We don't yet have a date for when that's coming in force, but I think it's all generally um, indicating that things are moving in a good direction that will hopefully um, help when, when businesses do look to move into the Brazilian market. And then as a final tax topic on the corporate side, we wanted to touch upon the global tax reform that's being led by the OECD's Pillar 1, Pillar 2 framework. Um, the Pillar 1 piece is the less refined component at this stage, there's still a bit of work the OECD is doing, and it's only applying to, or broadly should only be applying to the largest um, 100 businesses in the world. So we're going to focus more on Pillar 2. Um, which is the referring to them as the global rules. And what Pillar 2 is looking to bring in is a, a minimum global tax rate of 15%. That will apply to multinational groups that have consolidated revenues of more than 750 million euros. And things are picking up pace with this. Um, many jurisdictions, including the UK, are looking to have these rules in place for periods beginning on or after. 31st of December 23. So just thinking of the wider timing, we've had a lot of detail published over the last year. We're expecting more coming in this year as everyone moves towards that implementation piece. Um, just to recap how the rules will work, um, the main mechanism being put forward is an income inclusion rule, and that's a kind of top-down approach where if you're a multinational group that falls within this, um, and one of your jurisdictions, your effective tax rate is below 15%, and um, the parent company will be responsible for applying and paying a top up amount to get that territory to 15%. There's also an under tax profits rule, which will kind of work as a backup mechanism. And I think more interestingly, the OECD rules are also allowing countries to introduce their own domestic minimum top up taxes and we think this would be quite a popular option because if there is this domestic minimum top up tax that will apply in priority over the income inclusion rule so if you're a jurisdiction even if your tax rate is ordinarily above 15 percent you might want to bring in that domestic minimum top up tax because that will give you the priority to the the top up amount above the parent company and it seems logical the um, governments will want to bring in something that gives them that entitlement to the tax. So we expect to see a lot of movement on this in a number of territories throughout this year and kind of changing, changing rates. Um, and then just to kind of cover what we think are some of the key challenges for these rules coming in, there's the obvious impact on effective tax rate, but also some kind of more practical points around the rules of the draft rule was um, published by the OECD uh, complex and quite long, so there's a lot to navigate in terms of understanding in order to be compliant. There'll also be an issue, I think, around data collation. The returns that need to be filed to comply with this have something like 200 data points and um, being able to make sure you have the information to meet all of those real <laughs> challenges and something to get ahead on. Um, 
to help though, the OECD has given some encouraging signs, introducing some uh, guidance on safe harbours at the end of December 22, and we expect to see more on this. And just to quickly cover off, we put up on the slide what, how we see the, this development with the global minimum tax impacting certain key territories. And to touch on a few, Gibraltar, um, we've already seen the rate go up to 12.5% in 2021, and I think it's widely expected that it will go up domestically to 15% in due course to match with the OECD. Malta, as many of you know, will have a 35% tax rate, but there's the ability to bring that down to 5%, and um, I through the tax refund regime or fiscal unity arrangements. Um, Malta has announced its intention to bring in a 15% tax rate for businesses that meet the 750 million threshold, but we still don't have very much at all, if anything, for how that's actually going to interact with the current tax refund regimes and fiscal unity pieces. So that's definitely one to watch as um, the year progresses. That's probably it for me. So I'm going to pass over to James, who's going to talk us through tax risk. Yeah, good morning, still, everybody. Um, my name is James Agat, I lead our national tax insurance and risk management team here at BDO. I'm also aware I've got a lot of slides and I'm also aware we're running late, so I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to skip to the ones that I think are more interesting and uh, you can take away in your own time all the other slides and feel free to call me up and question me about them later on. But really what I want to do is, um, Daisy's done an excellent presentation looking at some of the technical details. My job really is to support businesses in providing them with like a culture of no surprises when it comes to tax, helping them manage their tax operations. So what I do really is focus very much on process, control, governance and risk management. And for a lot of businesses that are fast growing, a lot of businesses that are hitting th certain thresholds with HMRC, what you'll find is that you'll get your customer compliance manager, HMRC, maybe other stakeholders, maybe the board, maybe investors, all interested in how you're managing your tax operations and ensuring that culture of no surprises when it comes to tax risk. That's my job, that's what I help businesses do, and probably one or two aspects will be familiar to you. So what I'm gonna do is first of all, just talk a little bit about the background, which is my little graph there. And that's a graph of increasing regulation and need for transparency when it comes to tax. So some of you will be more familiar with that than others. So I've been working in the area of tax risk and process for like ever, since 2005 and Sarbanes-Oxley, if you know about that, and that was all about controls and processes. And since then, we've had things like the business risk review. We've had senior accounting officer, which keeps me busy. More recently, we've had issues such as publication of tax strategy, CCO, which yes, is economic crime, but also manages tax risk. And now more recently, we have the uncertain tax treatment, MTD, et cetera. So you've got a day job to do in the world of tax and finance. Your day job is to get the compliance in on time. Your day job is to optimize your tax position without pushing it too far. But also there is this increasing need to demonstrate good behaviors when it comes to tax. And for some of you, you'll be looking to build up your tax function to manage these risks. And I've been working with this industry for a while and what we're seeing is increased focus on what you're doing in terms of tax risk and tax transparency. So I'm going to talk a little bit about what that means in practice and what businesses are doing. I won't talk about SAO and CCO too much. Uh, I think Tim Ferriss will be happy about that because mm -hmm. I talk about it all the time. But SAO and CCO are two regulatory requirements that require businesses to respond to certain legislative needs from HMRC, so annual certification for SEO, and you definitely have to get your CCO defense in place because that's going to be focused on in this year, 2023, we think. So if you haven't done anything on either of those two in a relevant view, CCO is relevant for everyone. SEO, if your um, UK revenues are in excess of 200 million, then please take that away and have a look at it. Uh, uh, but fortunately for most people in the audience, we're not going to focus on it too much over the next five minutes. So I talk about a lot of words like tax control framework, and I talk a lot about words like tax vision. But I just want to pause on this page here. This is a roadmap document and a roadmap image I use quite a lot with businesses because it's relevant for everyone. You might have a large tax function. You might not have any tax people at all. But that journey there of the road 
is what we are recommending a lot of businesses go on. And you might be at different places on it. So what we're saying is, if you really do want to embed a culture of no surprises, if you want to embed good tax governance in your business, you do need to start with thinking about what tax means for you. What is your vision? Are you seeking to be low risk appetite? Are you seeking to engage transparently with tax authorities? Are you seeking to have clear risk management in relation to tax within the business? You need to start with that vision and then you need to articulate it in terms of the policies, procedures, governance and tax risk management. So you go around that circle. So when I talk to a lot of businesses, we go on that journey and we think about what it means for each of those. And I'll touch on that only a little bit now. So for a lot of organisations, it's about where to start. So where are you now in terms of tax governance and where do you want to be in two or three years time? So where you might be now is very reactive. You respond to regulation late. Maybe tax is brought in late in the game in terms of commercial decisions. And what you really need to be is much more proactive. Tax needs to be part of those decisions. Tax needs to be brought in early. And there needs to be the understanding of how tax risk is managed in the business. So we often start with this tax vision. And I think this is probably the key slide, which I want to focus on. So if you're on that journey, start with those principles. And then we do spend quite a bit of time ironing out and defining expected standards of conduct in how tax is managed in the business. So do you have procedures on how you deal with tax authorities? Do you have procedures on when the rest of the business picks up the phone and asks questions about tax? Do you, within finance and tax, want to spend a lot of time answering questions about what VAT is, what the VAT uh, uh, rate is on a chair, or perhaps you should be more concerned about uh, the input in relation to a major transaction or ERP implementation before it's too late? So it's about those business partnering rules. And of course, I have to mention transfer pricing. I think you can't get through a tax presentation without transfer pricing. So also what you would want to do is make sure your transfer pricing policies are excellent and also are embedded within the business. So that's all linked into it. And that helps you define that tax control framework. And it's not just about good governance, but when HMRC come in, they will be asking for these things. And if you haven't got them, you're going to get a low, you won't get a low risk rating and they'll be knocking on your door more and more. So there's lots of external pressures to have that in place. So as a takeaway, not now, because I could read all of this out, but we've got half hour, but this is the typical contents of what some of your peers are doing in terms of articulating what's in that tax policy. So you can nick that for later and think about, do we have something like this? Do we have... Um, articulation of tone at the top, accountabilities or responsibilities for tax. So you know who's accountable for corporate tax, but what about global mobility that um, uh, young Daisy was talking about? Who's managing the risk of people working in overseas jurisdictions, that residency risk, the PE risk, the global mobility risk? So who's looking at that? And if you have people who are accountable and responsible, that risk will be minimised. This is an offer because Jason was here earlier and said this Jason was talking a lot about offerings and things like that. So I felt that I could do the same. So this is an example of the kind of stuff that we do for our clients. So for many of them who don't know where to start, often they bring us in for like a couple of hours and they say, could you please help us just to sort of benchmark where we are against good practice? And so what we have, which is similar perhaps to other accountancy firms, because I was there because I was at Deloitte and I was at EY for a while and I've just recruited somebody from PwC, is that we do this sort of benchmarking tax operations maturity model exercise. And it's worth doing, worth thinking about. Where do you think you sit in terms of levels of maturity in relation to governance, corporate tax, indirect taxes? You'll be strong in some areas, maybe not strong in others. I definitely don't think everyone needs to be level five like everything's running brilliantly. But perhaps if you are here, you need to think about getting to something which is more managed because that will reduce risk and create efficiencies in tax and finance. And so those are some of the conversations that we have with clients about that journey that they go on. All right, I've got no idea. I did say I was going to be short, so I actually have accelerated a little bit. 
The one thing I am going to do now, because I know this is an issue for one or two of the people in this industry, is talk <coughs> about ESG. Has anybody talked about ESG so far? How can you not have a presentation without ESG? That's outrageous. Anyway, we should bring it up now. So here it is. This is your ESG tick the box. ESG is something which is on the board agenda. So it has to be thought about. And the T, in case anybody is surprised, stands for tax. Where does tax fit in within your ESG framework? So once again, you've got the responsible tax type timeline, but we're going to skip that and just think about it. So where does tax fit within environmental? Maybe not for you. Maybe there's not a lot of plastic packaging tax in your everyday life. And if, uh, fortunately, we can uh, thank your lucky stars. Is there a plastic packaging tax presentation after this? Not even you, Tim. Good. Yeah, good. So they, that kind of thing. But electric vehicles may be something that should be considered. And there's various incentives that could be considered there. So that's a good thing in terms of advantage. However, I'm going to look at social and governance because those are the questions that come up. So obviously in social, if the bottom bullet point there is all about national minimum wage, equal pay, and that all has tax implications. So if you start implementing things like that or thinking about things like that, there will be a tax repercussion. But my job is in the G, obviously, because it's about governance today. So G for governance. So what we are seeing and what you might need to do is think about have you published a tax strategy? To what extent are you ready for questions in terms of are you good taxpayers? What is your effective, take, uh, effective rate of tax? To what extent <coughs> are you able to talk about the tax, total tax contribution in various different countries? To what extent are you able to talk about your approach to tax risk management, whether or not you seek to only uh, pursue tax planning opportunities which are in line with the spirit of the law. These kind of questions are coming up, not just by tax authorities, but potentially by the board if they say, where is, where is tax within our wider ESG agenda? And you can look at businesses from Vodafone to Anglo-American. I know they're large, well-established businesses, but they've written 100-page reports on this. Other businesses are beginning to write what we call our approach to tax. And so it's worth thinking about what your peers are doing and do you need to do something similar? And of course, that's all wrapped up into risk management and tax. You can't really do that until you've done everything else. So actually, that was a whistle stop to it. Hopefully, I've caught up a bit of time just in case you've got a lunch date or something. But hopefully, that will help you out. <coughs> but now we have got our key next week, haven't we, David? So it's key next to say, I did warn you. So I'll hand over to David. Thank you. Thank you, James. Uh, and hello, everybody. Um, um, so I, I wouldn't hesitate to call this light relief, but this uh, is a bit of conversation around pay, uh, which is a subject um, that everybody has a vested interest in in some way, shape, or form. Um, and it's a particular uh, interest now. Not least because globally we find ourselves in a series of inflationary cycles which most people who look after pay have yet to experience. So it's the first time they've been trying to manage inflation in a pay review in one fell swoop. Um, and also it's come at the same time, particularly in your sector, in fairness, where we have scarce skills that we still are desperately trying to bring on board. So if one combines the two things, we definitely have an issue that we are trying to fix here. So what I am going to do is just have a conversation about a couple of things which are designed, I suppose, to help us along that journey in the context of how much do we pay people. So first of all, let's pick up some very high level themes that uh, your sector is experiencing at the moment. I've been at great pains to make those themes which are for your sector and not for every sector uh, one could ever possibly think about. Um, but the trouble is, there are some things here which everyone is wrestling with. So forgive me if you think that would be the same if I were a retailer. I think the answer is possibly, but maybe more so for you. Um, we're also going to have a talk specifically around reward and inflation and how people are now approaching the application of pay uh, to individuals 
given we have in many jurisdictions inflation at 10 percent when we are no used to it being about two and a half uh, and we are going to have a conversation around aspects relating to architecture around roles and people in the organization for businesses which are struggling, I suppose, to articulate what a career looks like or how much one should be paid for doing a particular job in a business. I'll leave you with some final thoughts uh, for you to talk about in the pub. Uh, right, what are the themes that we are seeing more and more and more? There are four I've pulled out for you here. Um, one is around margin preservation and growth. So fundamentally, in pay terms now, we are much more interested in focusing on matters of cost, matters of measuring and identifying performance and, and cash. So if you think around incentives, fundamentally, we may have had strategic objectives sitting over here once, which said we'd like to achieve this, we'd like to roll out that, we'd like to go into this market. The greater preponderance of activity these days is focused around hard metrics designed to keep the business safe for the future. And whether you are in profit, you are burning cash, the issues remain the same. So fundamentally, the interventions that we see around pay are, are built around ensuring it's focused in the right place, that it's no more than we need to spend to create an environment that makes that talent want to stay, but we're also incentivizing the right things. Second on my list, how and where my people work. So this is an issue in the UK. Uh, in the context of do I work in London, do I work in Newcastle, if I can work in either and do the same job, uh, what's the rate of pay one would apply, but clearly it's now an issue globally, so actually the debate is not between London and Newcastle, it's between London and anywhere else you may pick in the world, and that comes with a series of compliance obligations, it also comes with a competitive advantage if you can land how best to do that in a governance framed and compliance managed way. So, for example, uh, we have many organisations now who are producing, uh, I suppose, safe countries. We don't mind if you go and work here. We can manage that. We can deal with the compliance obligation. Countries which we are on notice are trickier. We can make that work, but only for shorter periods of time. And no go, you absolutely are not going there whether you wish to work from anywhere or not. Third on my list uh, is around fundamentally compliance. So getting things wrong uh, is actually a bigger and bigger issue for organisations. So in a pay context, whether it's gender pay, whether it's national minimum wage, whether it's pay ratio <coughs> disclosure, uh, whether it's broader pay transparency, it is now a case where if organisations see they have a failure in that space, it's almost being defined as a failure of purpose. So it goes to brand value, it goes to share price, it goes to investor sentiment, and people are therefore taking much, much greater care to set up controls and frameworks of the like that James has just taken us through to make sure we don't have those sorts of issues coming to bite us on an unexpected basis. Fourth on our list in a thematic sense is around employee experience. So what can we do to make us an employer of choice uh, above and beyond simply paying this amount of money? What we see in our world is that you have to pay the right amount of money to get people over the threshold, but that's not the thing that makes them engaged and go the extra mile, somewhat disappointingly. So you can throw as much money at this as you want if you can't get those other pieces right, which go to the root of an overarching employee value proposition, then you still won't have dealt with the issue. Pay is our hygiene factor. Get it wrong, massive problem. Get it right, still got to do a whole load of things to make sure that this is the place people want to stay in. So, in light of those themes, cost, uh, where do I work, um, getting things right in a transparent and governance framed way, uh, and making our employees as comfortable and engaged in the organisation as we can, let's have a little look at inflation. So really, this has been the first year, uh, with the exception, of course, some jurisdictions have been managing inflation and indeed hyperinflation for many years, but this is the first year we've been seeing it in a meaningful way in jurisdictions that simply are not used to it. And what I thought it would be helpful just to briefly run through is what is the response that we are seeing 
from organisations who sit in that highly skilled, highly transferable um, and, and highly technical roles that we are often finding and indeed you're finding are very prevalent in your sector. So the key message, somewhat counterintuitively in a cost of living crisis, is that what this has done, what this inflationary spike has done, is put page to the concept of an across the board cost of living pay increase. So the message out there now for organisations wondering how best to manage their pay review is that they are segmenting their populations and for all intents and purposes, paying different amounts to different segments of their population. So for example, they may be paying higher amounts to the group that have got the scarcer skills and are at risk, so higher amounts flowing through to the text base. They may be paying higher amounts to <coughs> those areas or jurisdictions where they have a key business priority to make sure they manage the business risk of people leaving. They may be diverting different amounts to people who sit at different seniority levels in the business. So, for example, we have seen many organisations pay higher amounts to people who are lower paid on the basis that inflation hits those hardest, lower amounts to people who are higher paid on the basis that usually that can be addressed. The absence of a pay review in that space can be addressed through higher equity awards, perhaps a higher bonus opportunity, because total cash is not such a priority for people in that earnings bracket. They will never say that is the case, but factually, I think that's where we probably find ourselves. We're also seeing pay being diverted to better respond to market uh, shortfalls. So if your role sits below market and another role sits above market, markedly different pay reviews being applied to each population, and we are then seeing pay being diverted through to those people who are developing skills which you need in your business. So there are six things on that list, which for all intents and purposes, when an organisation now says, what pay review are you providing your population? Generally, they're going somewhere between naught and 30% because they are, they are applying this segmentation to that level of extreme. Um, but what you can see, I'll put some numbers there on the right hand side, which is a result of a, uh, we got about 300 reward professionals to answer this question at an event we ran last year. And what those numbers tell you, you can look at them in the cold light today, you can get a bit closer to them in future, but for all intents and purposes, 75% of those 300 people are using overarching pay budgets of less than 7.5%. So think about it like this, segment your population and apply different amounts to different people, but also note that the overarching amount that is being deployed on an overnight increase basis is significantly less than the inflation rate that we are seeing in most of these jurisdictions. So in the context of the UK, uh, for example, 5% is our new 3%. It may be that people were mucking around with 3% pay rises for years, actually. Uh, that number's moved up to five. It's not moved up much beyond five. So if you look at the data that we can get at the minute, that number is not sitting much above five. Um, linked to that whole question of how much do you pay people on a segmented basis for doing different jobs, is this second piece, which we are spending an enormous amount of time with clients looking at, which is traditionally in a business, we carve our population up by level, so we have a hierarchy, and by function, so we have different skills that sit in different businesses. If you apply that to BDA, we have people who do audit, we have people who do tax, I've somewhat oversimplified it, but you can see we have families of people and we have levels. What we're seeing in businesses, particularly those which have got a preponderance of technology roles, is that that old way of looking at hierarchy and pricing roles is no longer as fit for purpose as it was. So we are much more interested in the skills and capabilities that a team need to deliver and how much do we need to pay to get those skills and capabilities in one room than we are in saying, what level am I at? Who's my manager? How many roles are sit above me? How many are below me? So we are spending time with a number of clients now crafting what we've called here new types of job architecture. 
much more built around skills, much more built around the requirement of a business to build stuff and ultimately need to get the right people in the room to do that. And that drives how much you pay those individuals undertaking that role. It doesn't mean your CEO is paid a different amount or your Exco, because that tends to be more globally benchmarked. But when you get to the level below Exco, you're seeing much more disparate pay amounts flowing through to people as a consequence of businesses deciding to value their skills in different ways. So this would be the exercise you go through to try to kick the way that you pay your people into the right uh, business need. If you are hearing constantly, we just can't pay the right amount to these people, uh, they're always leaving, they're always saying they can get more in the market, it's probably something to do with the architecture point, rather than you not using your benchmarks properly, it's actually a slightly more substantive <laughs> question. So uh, I just thought I'd leave you with these four sentences really, which is <clears throat> there are some things going on probably not focused at the senior executive end of the spectrum, which I do think we should bear in mind. So the first one on this list talks about the declining presence of tech businesses in the UK listed market. So the last big IPO I worked on for a, a, a gaming business, it got pulled at the absolute uh, 11th hour, uh, as is the case with some IPOs, I suppose. But the astonishing thing about it was, um, if you talk to a CEO, coming out of a private equity world, going into a role in a UK listed business, it is very difficult to construct a pay package where that individual looks at it and says that is an exciting proposition. And there is a preponderance, of course, of businesses which are seeking to list in the US where they have a different approach, attitude, and indeed number that one would attach to pay. So something to bear in mind there around the attractiveness of certain places, not just due to access to capital, but due to, to access for remuneration frameworks that people will find attractive. The second thing on my list is due to volatility of performance, it's harder and harder to create long-term incentives that have targets underpinning them that people value uh, <coughs> because they definitely know how hard it is to predict three years worth of composite performance. So we're seeing greater focus or value placed on short-term incentives and bonus than on long-term, which actually is a bit of a change for us. They are now increasingly important in the context of the piece of pay that someone will look at and attribute value to. Um, James talked about ESG. We are absolutely seeing ESG being linked to incentives. So we are incentivizing people to deliver ESG targets. It's a really difficult thing to do. You can't incentivize someone to pay the right amount of tax. It's not bonusable. It doesn't make any sense. It's hard to incentivize someone on the journey to net zero. Uh, it's hard because by putting 10% of your incentive to achieving that outcome, all you've actually done is priced in the cost of not achieving it. So an executive can look at that and say, is it worth my while to strive to achieve that outcome? And the final thing on my list, which is part of a composite of all that we've talked about, I think, is just the increasing evidence we've got out there that your executive directors, um, lovely though they are and hard though they work, are ceasing to be the most popular roles within an organisation. So increasingly, Someone might say, I don't want to be the CEO of this business. I want to be there because that gives me the freedom to do the things I want to do. So it becomes more of a figurehead role. Your board is shrinking in an executive capacity. And actually people are saying, where can I get to that will enable me to do this job in a way uh, that doesn't come hidebound with some of the regulations, some of the rules and some of the issues that now we're wrestling with the greater and greater proportions <coughs> of our day. Well, they are my final thoughts, so I will stop. Thank you very much. Hi, everyone. I'm Martin Haynes, uh, Christian Hines, and I'm responsible for a couple of uh, indirect tax related developments that we think are interesting for the sector. Conscious, we've got the graveyard shift again. We normally tell you about things that are bad news for the sector, risks to watch out for. So, um, break from tradition, we're going to start with something a little bit more positive. So, shock announcement <clears throat> Spanish budget in December. 
now passed into law with effect from 1st of January. Spain has radically reduced the scope of its use and enjoyment exemption as it applies to BAP. <clears throat> uh, pretty much now, almost all B2B services um, will be outside of the scope of the Spanish use and enjoyment rules. This means going forward, marketing services bought by a non Spanish business should no longer be subject to Spanish VAT. So, a quick reminder a use and enjoyment rules are a useful tool for the tax authority. It can add a VAT charge or proportion of VAT charge where the normal rule would say VAT doesn't apply, but there's effective consumption in the territory. The flip side, if the normal rule would say there should be a local VAT charge, there's effective consumption outside the territory, the use and enjoyment rules can, can relieve the application there. There's some logic and theory behind using enjoyment rules, but there's always issues in practice, particularly from the supplier's point of view. <clears throat> you rarely have um, accurate data, if data at all, to get the pricing right and to apply the rules in a way upfront that a Spanish tax authority or a tax authority would be happy with, but also your customers would accept from a commercial perspective. Spain was a leader of these rules, and some would say an aggressive um, applicator of them. Um, <clears throat> So while we understand the attractiveness of tax authority, it, it did come as a pleasant surprise to hear, hear these rules announced. The main rationale was a drive from business and actually tax officers on the ground saying that looking for unworkable, you're making Spain not a competitive environment for marketing related services and other intangible services. Um, that echoes what we heard in the UK four, five, six years ago now, at least track of time, when Treasury and HMRC looked actually expanding the scope of the UK's own use and enjoyment rules and lots of noise from business saying that these are unworkable, business will be driven away from the UK, <clears throat> seem to take effect, and Spanish now seem to um, follow suit on that. Um, so like I said, pleasant surprise, because um, we did think post-Brexit it would be a bit of an arms race to increase the use of these rules and uh, increase the tax take, but luckily today we haven't seen any of that. I want to slightly more negative news again, back to, back to type. Um, thanks to a bank. So that's a case from 2021. There's another case just before it called Scandia. These are all about VAT grouping within Europe and what does it actually mean to be a member of the VAT group, particularly when you've got branches in different jurisdictions. Is the whole legal entity in the VAT, VAT group or just the country establishment? With the impact being when there's cross border supplies between the branch and the head office, do we think about VAT or not? Thanks to a bank says yes, as, as Scandia. Um, but a lot of uh, European member states and the UK indeed have been quite slow to react to this case. We're expecting to see more movement this year. I think the Netherlands now announced they're going to follow the case from 2024. But obviously the key one for this sector is, is more to react to this case. We've been forced to react with it voluntarily, make some changes. Because of course Malta considers the entire legal entity to be a member of the map. On something now that could be good, could be bad but definitely interesting, it will be a very slow burner. Um, there's potential for the scope of VAT exemptions and the rates of VAT views in the UK to change going forward. So back in 2017, the Office for Tax Simplification produced a report suggesting that the Treasury and HMRC should look at the scope of VAT in the UK, review to make some changes, um, give the name of the OTS, I guess they intended to simplify it, but you know, whether that will um, bear fruit, who knows. There's a follow-up report in 2019 noted that member states in Europe have got increased, increased flexibility to use different rates of VAT, not just one or two reduced rates and standard rate. Um, and it was sort of part thinking, let's see what, what happens after Brexit, we're going to come back to it. Obviously, in COVID came along, everything's been put up on the back burner, tax projects um, very much delayed. But there was an issue logged on the JVCC, or to give its full name, the Joint VAT Consultative Committee. Bit of a tongue tie there. <clears throat> uh, this is a HMRC sponsored forum with uh, basically every representative body going from ITAW, CIT, all the interested parties, the A's from HMRC discuss how VAT works and I have problems and introduce new policy changes moving forward. Subgroups being formed to look at this specific project and the rates of VAT use in the UK and the scope of the VAT exemption with various different subgroups then for each industry sector, one of which is the betting gaming sector, which we're going to stay very close to. Now, it's going to be a long road, I think, personal view, for any changes to happen, and I don't see the betting gaming sector necessarily being a priority sector for radical change here, but it's important the sector stays close to these discussions. For example, some very prominent and respected technical people 
per party scoring group. So raise the question, why is there even a VAT exemption in the UK for betting gaming? So a quick reminder, operators that actually do the gambling, generally the income streams are VAT exempt, so they pay VAT, but of course you pay a, an excise duty, um, depending on the exact form of gambling you carry out in the UK. So what we can't have is VAT at standard rate introduced, but still uh, excise duties. So this is a definitely one to, to watch and follow. <clears throat> HMRC administration service levels. I am fully aware we're recording this, so I'm not going to say too much, but I think it's fair to say service levels are not good. Um, particularly if you need to make an error disclosure um, and refunds, you will be looking at several months more than likely to hear anything from HMRC. But even when you're trying to pay HMRC a mistake you've made or get certainty over a particular position, and it does hold up real world transactions. That grouping. Responses seem to be non existent. Again, that's causing delays to you know, corporate restructurings and transactions and certainty from businesses. <clears throat> There's also um, part of HMRC's approach to manage their backlog and administrative burden. They've introduced a, a process change to the options tax rules. Um, so, quick reminder of options tax. Supplies of most land and buildings starts as VAT exempt, but you can normally opt to tax and add VAT to those supplies. You're probably thinking, why am I telling the betting gaming sector about this? Well, I'll come back to that in two seconds. Um, option to tax two stage process. Business makes a decision they want to opt to tax, then you have to notify mm -hmm. the HMRC. Back in the good old days, they'd send you a formal acknowledgement so you've got it for your file and you can keep your audit partner happy and satisfy um, the details on transactions. Um, that stops from September, it's downgraded to just a receipt. That's going to go complete on February, and you're just going to get an automated email, but only if you notify HMRC by email. And there's some teething problems with the emails that they can't be linked to the original option. And I think you can see where I'm going here is on the that status of a property and whether it's opted or not is important um, when you come to sell a business or sell a property. Property is worth lots of money, millions of pounds at stake. Your advisors aren't going to be happy if we can't prove that the seller's opted or not at the correct time. So this could be a real world problem across all sectors, even this gaming sector that can hold up transactions. Because HMRC have also announced they're going to stop telling you if you if somebody's opted or not. So if you think of a building that's quite old but valuable, maybe this building, we need to know if it's opted or not. Staff changes over the number of years, or maybe a few different transactions before it comes to us, who's now looking to sell a building. HMRC in very limited circumstances now will tell you if it's been opted or not. So we have to wait to see how that develops. <clears throat> Just on HMRC service levels as well, we are seeing a worrying number of conversations with HMRC not being recorded. It's more important than ever you, if you have a call with HMRC, full telephone note straight away and insist on a reference number. Um, so you don't have to start all of the process again. And if you, if you do get advice from HMRC, you've got some sort of evidence from it. Linking back to what I was saying, the problems for options tax, it's more important than ever to have a register. I'm sure James and the tax risk team would be happy with that as well. Um, and capital goods scheme as well. Um, historically, not given too much concern by HMRC or thought by businesses. Capital goods scheme applies. You've got land or property over 250k. You need to look at its taxable use over a 10 year period, making an adjustment each year. Again, on a transaction, depending on the type of transaction, you've probably got to hand these records over to the buyer. Um, so it's more important than ever to, to have good records there. And finally, we some fruits at some pace. A um, couple of cases that we think are interesting for the sector to watch. So we've got the Hippodrome Casino case last year in the first tier tribunal. They won their case um, by the standard method override. So Hippodrome Casino has a mixture of taxable income for VAT purposes, food and beverages, theatre tickets, and obviously um, a core from stream of being a casino, land based casino. Um, so it's partially exempt. In the absence of having a formal contract, a partial exemption special method agreed with HMRC. A default to work out how much back you can get back on your overheads is based on turnover. But there is a, a, an often overlooked rule called the standard method override, which you're actually required to look at every year, but most businesses forget about it. Um, it says that if there's a, it's a more fair and reasonable, if there's a better property for working out um, your, your um, residual VAT recovery, you, you need to apply this if the difference is substantial. Um, so 
hip joint reductor use those rules and they um, put in a claim for recovering their VAT back using HMRC's favourite method, a floor space method. It's nearly impossible to try and get a floor space method for the agreed with HMRC. As expected, they disputed the, the claim. They ended up in tribunal. The taxpayer won pretty convincing first tier tribunal judgment, but not binding on anybody else. And that's been appealed. So anybody um, that's UK based and partially exempt, I think this is a case to watch um, and it's due to be heard in October 23. Finally, pay tell the tour. So <clears throat> this is another case, uh, taxpayer won at first tier tribunal uh, due to be heard by others here in June 23. This is a really interesting case. So um, the sale of existing shares, not the sale of um, issue of new shares, sale of existing shares VAT exempt are made in the UK. You make VAT exempt supply, can't pay that back on your cost. This case questions that and the established logic and what we thought we knew to be the rules and definitely um, goes against HMRC's established practice here. In this case, the, the reason for the share sale was to invest in other taxable activity and the tribunal allowed the taxpayer to look through that exempt transaction. Normally in VAT, we look at every step in isolation. We don't look through transactions normally in VAT world. So this is a really interesting case. And again, if, the, if they win at the upper tier you, that's then a binding decision other businesses can look at. So if you've got a fact pattern where you've sold shares and blocked that recovery because the share sale would have been exempt for the last four years, you should start thinking about whether you put in a claim to stand behind these cases. <coughs> VAT is a four year statutory limitations in the UK. So that's me real quickly. I'm going to go to Chris to cover the duty side of things. Um, yes, hello. So um, I guess two things to talk about. One, the backward looking and quite operational, and one, I suppose, forward looking and a bit wider. Um, so, first off, there was quite a large campaign for HMRC last year uh, on remote gaming duty hitting quite a lot, a wide variety of operators. So particularly ones who are based abroad, um, haven't really had much engagement with HMRC before. Um, this is the first sort of proper compliance check they went for, I suppose. Um, everyone used the same um, template and it was really asking about free plays. Uh, a lot of other things as well, but free plays would be the one. Um, HMRC, the rules changed in 2017. Um, so you have to account for the tax duty on the first use of the free play. Um, and there was an awful lot of um, discussion and engagement for the industry in HMRC about how viable this was to monitor and how viable it was to track. Um, HMRC are finally going around seeing what the industry is doing about that, I suppose. Um, generally, I think it's been pretty good news, or the ones I've seen anyway, um, sort of eight to ten of them. Um, operators were generally compliant, um, were tracking it, and were able to, to, to put the duty on. Um, it did so a few other things, though, more, more so than just actually think that probably all right. Um, one, HMRC officers really don't understand the business at all. Um, so many questions about what a mini game is, um, what a, uh, sort of a two stage game would look like, how a free spin might work. I mean, stuff that you sort of kind of seen everyone sort of ostracize from wide society now. Um, so, really, really need to be walked through. If you have any compliance checks, um, don't assume they have any background knowledge in history at all, even though they might come from the gambling team. Um, a lot of the gambling team pre prior to 2018 worked mainly on machine gaming duty. So they go to pubs, find fruit machines, um, and ask how they work and take money out. So they're not a huge digital native. Um, second thing worth note is that HMRC wanted to uh, use quite a lot of what they call system checks. So more so than just to talk you through the return, it's actually walking through return, um, show what software you have, what's your priority software, how do you account for this from a transaction level. So if I'm a uh, person putting five pounds of free bets on, what's it look like in your transactions? How does that flow through to the ERP system? How does that flow through the duty return? Um, mainly seen on RGD, but I would expect them to also apply it across the board now to more generally to all the, all the gambling taxes. So uh, general bet and duty, um, MGD, uh, uh, pull bet and duty as well. One other key aspect we found is that HMRC, in our experience anyway, haven't really challenged valuation of first of free spins. If you have given it a value and that value looks broadly similar to other sorts of games you run, we've not seen HMRC go in and say, actually, no, we want actually MPS to be a pound each time. Um, we don't think they have any legislative backing to do that, um, but it's quite nice to see that so far at least they haven't. Where we have found HMRC cause problems with that 
is where zero value has been given to the first free flow, and in particular, where zero value has been given and the T's and C's say something else. In this case, the T's and C's um, said something else for a completely different reason. It was basically a competition to see who could make the most money. So you have to have a notional value so someone could be the winner at the end. HMRC still wanted sort of 10 times um, the actual revenue generated by the company over its operational lifetime because these fake numbers are in the T's and C's. So check your T's and C's for uh, replays or bonus games, that sort of thing. Um, second thing, which I think I said some relatively similar when I was here in 2019 and was not proven right then, so maybe maybe hope hope no proven right this time as well, um, is that there is going to be pressure again tax rises. Um, historically, obviously RGD and GBD were 15%. Uh, RGD is now 21% um, and it's raised quite a lot more money. Um, it's shown in the UK sense that actually increasing the tax rate does bring in more money um, without significant amounts of sort of um, diversion to other channels. Sweden has 21% as well. Um, Netherlands has something horrible. Um, but these are all quite higher than the UK rate. So there's not a huge amount of money in sort of overall government terms within gambling duties, three billion pounds a year in tax, um, one billion in RGD, 650 million in GBD. Um, so it's not going to solve any fiscal problems by itself, but 350 million is 1% versus pay rise. So if you want to put 25% to GBD, you can pay for 1% versus pay rise a year. I mean, as a sort of political trade-off, it seems pretty, pretty enticing to me. Um, the one thing against this is, of course, the ongoing white paper. So there will be some some disagreement, or some pushback um, to try and amend the gambling duty reform while there is still ongoing DCMS uh, DCMS reform. Um, there are seven gambling duties. The system probably does need reform. I mean, it's too many. There's some crossover. Um, it's all very complicated. Um, but there will be some pushback from the government on the idea of trying to reform gambling duties or increase gambling duties whilst DCMS is still going on for fear of people saying we're prejudging the review, the regulatory review. So that's probably, I guess, the one light spark, I suppose, in what I think I said last time it happened, so maybe again it won't happen again. But there is, I think, a very strong push towards increasing um, the duty rates, uh, at least up to sort of RGT's 21% across the board. On that happy note, I'll start. Thank you. One final point, just picking up on what Chris was saying about HMRC's patchy understanding of business games work, etc. Um, <clears throat> I think it's essential if you do get correspondence with HMRC that you nail the fact pattern first time of asking. If HMRC starts to form a conclusion, in our experience, both from the duty side and VAT, it's increasingly hard to get them to change their conclusion. It seems to be, in their mind, the matter closed off their desk. The independent review process is increasingly more of a complaint process. Had HMRC done anything wrong, rather than a proper technical review of what's gone on? You really do increasingly get one chance to get it agreed with HMRC, so it's, it's essentially you nail the facts at the first time of asking and pounce on any new sound language or misunderstanding. Good, thank you. Thank you to all the speakers. Um, we haven't got any questions online, which means we've done everything in such great detail that it's very clear. Um, any questions from the room? I'm aware that we, we're over our expectations of time, even we're still within when we put the invites out. So um, if we haven't got any questions, I will wrap up. So uh, just just thank you all for coming. Um, some key messages, I think, that unsurprisingly, um, tax is going up. It will continue to have pressure to go up. There's things we've got away with in the past, some jurisdictions where we haven't had to pay as much as 15%, but that's on the way. So please do talk to uh, the tax team here to, to help with planning for that. Um, and uh, Chris is forecast again that there's going to be pressure. We, we know every uh, last couple of years we've been surprised that, that some of the AC and uh, duty rates haven't gone up, but I think they it will probably move one way pretty soon. So again, if there's planning to be done around that, please do come and talk to us. Um, there were some messages we had earlier on um, Responsible gambling, AML. I think we're working with pretty much everyone mm. saying who received some sanctions or some fines at the moment. But there's some good learnings we're getting out of that. And if anyone has any issues or you know, wants to avoid you know, 
please do talk to the team that we, we had uh, talking earlier. Um, lots of change because of COVID and the environment we're coming out of, and we do need to start looking at um, what we're doing and how we're managing the new world as we come out of it. So um, we will circulate the slides. Um, there's more information in the slides, as a lot of speakers said, than um, that was that gone through in detail. Uh, there's also going to be a recording sent around, so you'll get all of that coming through. Um, and please do look at the video website. There's, there's links to things there as you need them. Um, so thank you for those of us here, the 300. Um, we're going to have some lunch. If, if you can join us, please do. Uh, it's just across the way where we were earlier. So please do that. Um, thank you for everyone that's joined online. We're going to um, drop off now. So thank you very much.